Hey, how you doing? As you know, I'm Rob Wallace, and I'm with my wife, Prophetess Teresa Wallace. We are the pastors of Embassy Christian Center. Hi, welcome to our online service. We're so glad that you tuned in with us today. Yes, and we have a great word in store for you today, so stay locked in. Yes, but before we get started, we have an awesome worship leader. Her name is Renelda Johnson. She's going to sing, You Deserve It. So stay tuned and be blessed. Hallelujah. He deserves the glory. He deserves the praise.
This day, we want to give special honor to mothers all over the world. It can literally be said that we would not be here without you. You are the infusion of strength and the backbone of the family. You are the nurturing heart that warms our soul when we feel left out in the cold. You are that guiding hand that leads us through dark nights. God has specifically designed you to be vessels of love. You are such a blessing to the whole world and we appreciate you so much. Let me declare God's blessings over your life this day. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for every mother across the earth. I decree and declare your blessing shall come upon them this day to every mother, mother figure, every aunt to every grandmother, every godmother to every spiritual mother, every adoptive mother to fostering mother. Lord, I thank you for your mothers that you created to bring forth life, to give life and create purpose. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for fearfully and wonderfully making them I decree and declare that this is their year of Jubilee. This is their year of favor. And Lord, I thank you, Lord, for an abundance of rain coming upon them this season. Lord, I thank you for breakthroughs to manifest suddenly, oh God. I decree and declare financial breakthroughs, Lord, healing and deliverance, oh God, and life-changing restoration to their lives. Father, I decree and declare this is their year, Lord, and let there be a new thing that comes forth. I decree and declare their visions and dreams are restored oh god father that the manifestation lord god of your grace and your power be at work in them lord i speak life over your mothers god father i decree and declare that they are women of faith oh god father i thank you they are overcomers by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony lord father i thank you lord for grace and faithfulness lord that they wrap around their neck father i thank you for the garment of praise that they wear heavily god father i thank you that wisdom it enters their heart and knowledge is pleasant unto their soul lord that discretion shall guide and preserve them and understanding shall keep them god i thank you lord that strength and honor is theirs and they shall rejoice in their time to come lord i thank you for the joy of the lord is their strength i thank you lord that peace is theirs god lord and rest lord is theirs in this season father i call them forth lord to be the women that you have called them to be lord i bless every mother God and I thank you for this is their year Lord and they shall go out with joy and live forth in peace in Jesus name amen I had a vision of a man and looking at the man he was torn his clothes were tattered it looks like he had been beaten up very badly but I knew that this man was once strong, very vibrant and tall and, and, and vicious. But the appearance of the man was small in stature now. He, his clothes was ripped and it looked like he had been beaten up badly and he'd been through a battle and he had lost the battle badly. And I asked the Lord, what is that? And the Lord says that that man represents, it's a personification of an evil agenda currently for the world. And he says, thank you for your prayers for my will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. It is the prayers of the saints that has caused this man, this personification of evil agendas to be ravished. And he says, it is the prayers of the saints that has affected this agenda. 
But the Lord says that this agenda is not dead. It has been torn and worn and, and, and beaten down profusely, but it's still alive. And the Lord says, keep praying without ceasing for my will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, that this agenda would come to an end, says the Lord. I heard the Lord say, arise church, arise. Today is a dawning of a new, of a brand new day. Come to me, all who are ready. Prepare, for I'm sending in the lost and I want my people to be ready. Look at the fields, for they are ripe and ready. Ready. Look for opportunities and pay attention to the opportunities and step out in faith. Arm yourselves for the day of battle is near. Arm yourselves with prayer, and the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty through God. I kept hearing the Lord say, Arise, church, and be ready, for I'm sounding the alarm, and my bride is coming forth. He who has an ear, let him hear. He said, I'm coming to San Antonio, and I'm gathering my people for revival. I'm setting this city on fire. He said, Watch and pray for opportunities. I heard the Lord say, There's a flood coming to Texas. The flood is my glory, my anointing, and power. He says, see to it that you don't lose heart, for I'm raising up my people in this hour to represent me in the earth. There is a cloud of my glory that rests on my people, and I want my people to trust in me in this hour and do not grow weary in well-doing. The laborers are coming forth, and I heard the Lord say, build, to build my kingdom. But he who has an ear, let him hear. Matthew 5, verse 13, it says, You are the salt of the earth. But the salt has made tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under the foot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in the heaven. And the Lord said that the enemies come to hide and to cover and to seclude. But the Lord says, I've established light to shine through you. And the Lord said, it's this time more than ever to let your light shine and to be that light unto the people. To see what I am doing and not what the enemy is doing, says the Lord. Hey family, Embassy Christian Center is a place for you to thrive and grow. Please look us up on our Embassy CC group page, request to be a part of the group, and that's it. This month's theme is Purpose Revealed. God is going to uncover the hidden things that need to be revealed in this season. Stay close to God, stay diligent in prayer, and allow Him to reveal His purpose for your life. We are living in the last days, and Christ is coming soon. What will he find in you when he comes? Will it be fear, or will it be faith? I hope it will be faith, because without faith, it's impossible to please God. So keep yourself built up in the faith of God. A great way to keep your faith built up in God is by fellowshipping with us on Zoom for our growth groups. Our growth group leaders are amazing teachers. You will be blessed by the Word of God. Be sure to join us this Wednesday night, 7 p.m. with Elder Jennifer Hunt or Thursday night, 7 p.m. with Elder Andrew Tonti. We will post a link on Facebook for the growth group. Now, let's prepare to receive the Word of God. Hey, everybody. Praise the Lord. Well, happy Mother's Day. I am so glad to be with you all today. This is an amazing day. The first thing I want to say is happy Mother's Day to my mother and also all the other great mothers that are out there. We would not, literally would not be here without you. So I'm grateful to you. I'm also excited about this word that God has gave for us today. And I'm going to give you the title right up the front. And I want you to be excited about this because God is putting out a great demand upon his children. And guess what? If you are a born believer, you are his children. And so today, excuse me, 
Today, the title of my message is The Great Demand. The Great Demand. No, it's not a Mother's Day message, but yes, it is what God wants to speak to you today. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to Matthew chapter 4, starting at verse 15. I would say when you're there, I say amen, but I'm not going to be able to hear you say amen. So I'm just going to jump into the word and catch up if you can. Amen. Matthew, I'm going to just repeat it again. Matthew chapter 14, starting at verse 15. And it says, when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this place is desolate and the hour is already late. So send the crowd away that they may go into the village and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said to them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. Now, let me give you a little bit of backdrop on this story. So these people have been following Jesus for all this time, for three days. They have been following Jesus and Jesus was just filling them with the word of God, doing miracles, signs, and wonders. And they were so engulfed in what Jesus was doing that they did not even eat. So the disciples came to Jesus and they were concerned about them not eating. And so he was saying, hey, Jesus, you've been preaching for a long time, three days straight. Why don't you send them away so that they can get something to eat? And Jesus said something that was phenomenal to me. And it's phenomenal to me because I've seen this many times. I've looked at this many times, but really I was overlooking what Jesus really said to them. And he said, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And this was a demand. Not only was this a demand, but this was a great demand. Now, some of you may be thinking, uh, you might be stretching that a little bit, but I want to put you in mind and to think the demands that Jesus always put on his disciples. And if you're saved and you claim to love Jesus, I want you to understand that there is a great demand that's being put on you as well. But understand, remember when Jesus sent his disciples out to cast out demons, to heal the sick, and to preach the gospel? That was a great demand. He put that demand on them then. And if he's putting that demand on them then, then why would it be such a stretch to say that he was putting a demand on them to feed the those that were hungry? Why, was it, why would it be such a stretch to say that Jesus wanted them to do the miracle? Because I'm going to show you that Jesus really did want them to do the miracle. But before we do that, I want to define with you what a demand is. A demand is basically comes from a command. When I command you to do something, there is a demand. And God is commanding us to be his disciples and to go out and to do his work. What is, what is his work? His work is is part of the distribution of the kingdom of God. But I understand that many of us, we are not fully aware of what God had given us when we receive salvation. So I'm going to talk a little bit. I'm going to hit a little bit on the basics of salvation, but then I'm going to talk a little bit more about what you really got when you gave your life to the Lord. So let's look at this in Psalms 51, because this part that I'm about to read to you you're not going to have a hard time grasping it. You'll understand it because we preach this very well. We teach this very well. And I say we, when I say we, I mean us as pastors, teachers, evangelists, so on and so forth. So here it is in Psalms 51, starting at verse one, it says, be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before you. Against you, you only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth, pay attention to this, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inner parts and in the hidden parts. You will make known to me wisdom. Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be cleansed. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. So here, David is acknowledging that he is a sinner and that he needs the cleansing power of Jesus Christ. All of us that have come to Jesus Christ, we have acknowledged that. And what we have received is the salvation of the Lord. We know in John 3 and 3, when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, Jesus said to him, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, or verily, verily, I say to you, if anyone, uh, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, I want you to know that those of us that are born again, we see and operate 
from the place of the kingdom of God. I'm going to get into that a little bit more. But the way that we got this salvation is, you know, the scripture, many of us know the scripture. For those of you that don't, you might want to write this down. It's Romans chapter 10, verse 9. And it says this. It says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, confess him with your mouth, Jesus as Lord, not Savior, as Lord. I'm going to talk a little bit, the difference between a Savior and a Lord. A Savior is someone that you call on when you need saving. A Lord is someone that leads your life. So Jesus doesn't just want, does not just want to be your Savior. He wants to be your Lord so that everything that he has for you can be released in your life. Let me just pause and stop right here for a minute. The problem with many of us as believers is that we have just received Jesus Christ as Savior and not Lord. In other words, we want him to save us. We want to go to heaven, but we want to live the life that we want to live. And that's not what the Bible is telling us to do. It's telling us to confess with our mouth him as Lord, not just Savior. I hope you got that. Now watch this. And it says, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. For with the heart, a person believes. With your heart, you believe. You can fake it with your mouth, but you can't fake it with your heart. So with your heart, you believe. And that results in righteousness, in which is innocence and holy. And with the mouth, confess, resulting in salvation. So with my, so with my heart, I believe, which results in righteousness. With my confession, it results in, into salvation. So that's how we receive the salvation of the Lord. I believe in my heart that he is Lord, that he died for my sin, and I confess that. And at that moment, I am saved. There's a transformation. I am renewed in my spirit. I become brand new. Now, the problem is, is that many of us, when we prayed that prayer, some of us meant it, but we didn't feel something. Some people didn't mean it. And so therefore, there has to be a, a true confession and a belief in the heart that they can experience the salvation. But I'm not talking to those people right now. I'm talking to those that you meant it in your heart. You didn't necessarily feel nothing. And so therefore, it, it kind of hindered what you were believing as far as what was transforming inside of you and what was taking place on the inside of you. But I want to let you know that there's power in the blood. And the moment we believe in our hearts and we mean it and we confess with our mouth and we mean that, then the blood of Jesus Christ is applied to our life. And all of a sudden, there's a shift, there's a transformation, there's a renewal, and then also there's a release of the kingdom of God, not just upon your life, but in you now. The kingdom of God has come in you. Now you have righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit that's in you now, and now you have become a new creature. You are a new creation. Say that with me. God has made me brand new. Come on, say it. God has made me brand new. Now, now that he's made you brand new in your heart, now your mind needs to be renewed. You need to be transformed, renewed in your mind because your heart has transformed. Suddenly, now your, your mind has to catch up with your heart. I'm going to talk about that. So let's look at this. So the power, we need to understand that there's power in the blood. So Hebrews chapter 9, it says, How much more with the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, Offer himself without blemish to God. Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So the blood of Jesus Christ comes in you. It cleanses you. And now you are positioned to serve the living God. God positions you to serve him. And that's where we are now. We're in a position to serve him when we make that confession. And now in Romans, now this is the part that you have to understand. It's the part you have to get. In Romans chapter 8, verse 9, it says, However, listen to me, however, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. So if I'm going to look for where God has now placed you. I can't look for you. I cannot look for you in your flesh. I can only find you in the spirit. Here's the problem. It's not when I'm looking for you. It's when you are looking for you. Where are you looking for you at? Are you looking for you in the flesh or are you looking for you in the spirit? Because if you're looking for you in the flesh, then you will continually carry out the deeds of the flesh. But if you're looking for yourself in the spirit where God has placed you, 
then you will begin to walk in the spirit. Because the Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. If you think that you're still no good, if you think that you're still a sinner, if you think that God is still angry with you, angry with you, mad with you, he doesn't see you as a son, that he always rejects you. If you see that, then you're seeing yourself in the flesh and not in the spirit, and you're looking for yourself in the wrong place. And now when God places, excuse me, when God places a demand on you, you think that you can't fill it, fulfill it because you think that you can, you're thinking that he's asking you to fulfill it according to what you feel in your flesh. But that's not where you are. And when he asked the disciples, and when he told them, you feed them, what were they doing? They were trying to figure out how to do God's command according to the flesh and not according to the spirit. That's good right there. We're going to go a little further. Watch this. So let's look at this. In Revelation, because you have to understand your transformation. Because when he puts a great demand on you, and he's putting a great demand on all of us when he puts it on you, you have to understand who you are now, not what you were when before Christ found you and saved you. Amen? Say amen right there. Now, let's look at this in Revelations chapter 1. And I'm not going to be before you long. Revelations chapter 1, starting at verse 5. And it says, And from Christ Jesus, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loved us, what, who did he love? He loved us and released us from our sins, by his blood, there's power in the blood. And it's, then it says this, and he has made us to be a king or kings and priests to his God and father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. What did he make us through the blood? He made us kings and priests to his God to and father, to his God and father. So now we're no longer sinners, we're kings and priests. So when now, so now when God puts a demand on us, he's putting a demand on us from the perspective that we are now kings and priests in his kingdom, not sinners in the world. Do you get what I'm saying? So when you understand that, then there's a transformation. Now, let me pause. Do y'all remember this, this movie? Some of you all don't, I know I'm telling my age, but there was this movie and Leonardo DiCaprio, he played, he played the part of the king and also the prisoner. Um, he played a twin. And the name of the movie was Man in the Iron Mask. Some of you may remember that. It was back in the late 90s. So in this movie, there was this king who he played. There was this king and, his, and the way he lived his life, he didn't care anything about people. And so in other words, he used his rulership to serve him. He wasn't about serving people. He was about serving him. And he didn't care about anybody. And there were the soldiers or his guards who always looked over, for, looked over him and looked after him. But they were really honorable guards and servants of his. But they were also concerned because of the way that he ruled. So they came up with this idea. They knew that this king had a twin brother, but this, this king had put this twin brother in prison and put him in an iron mask because he never wanted his rulership to be threatened. So these guards, they got this idea, his royalty, his guards, I think they were the musketeers. They were the musketeers. They got the idea that they're going to break this prisoner out of prison and they were going to replace the king with him. So what they did is they broke him out. Now, the reason why they could use him and the reason why the guards couldn't be in that position because the guards did not have the royal blood. Only this twin that was in prison had the royal blood. I hope you're hearing what I'm saying. Only this twin had the royal blood in him. So they broke him out, but they couldn't immediately put him in the king's position because he never learned how to be what he was. Did you hear what I just said? He never learned how to be what he was, which was a royal king. He didn't know how to be a priest, if you hear what I'm saying. So they had to train him to be what he was. So when you get born again, it's not that you're not what you are, but it's that you have to learn to be what God has made you to be. You don't need more to come upon you. 
You need to understand how to release what God has placed in you through salvation, through the blood of Jesus Christ, through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You now have what you need to fulfill the great demand that God is placing on each and every one of us. There are different demands, but there are great demand. Why would God put a great demand on us? Because he said in his word, in greater works, you shall do greater works than him. So we're going we're gonna to look at this and we're going to continue to see how God will put this great demand on us based on what he's placed on the inside of us and based on what he has made us to be now, kings and priests. Are you with me? Now let's look at this scripture in Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 12. In Romans chapter 8, it says this. It says, so then, brethren, we are under obligation, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry, Abba, Father. So in other words, when the spirit of Christ came upon us, we now have the spirit of the son and it causes us to cry, Abba, Father. And then it says, the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God, children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Wait, it said fellow heirs with Christ. In other words, what Christ inherited, we also have inherited. It's not just being saved and going to heaven, but it's also the kingdom and the ability to operate the way Christ did. Now watch this. If indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Now, we all have heard, or I should say many of us, many of us has heard, and the Bible says that God would not share his glory with another. But here it says, uh, so that he may also be glorified with him. If we may, that we suffer with him, that we may be glorified with him. How is that possible? It's possible because when we come to Christ, God is not sharing his glory with another because now we have become one with him. So he's sharing the glory with himself as he's sharing it with you because now you and the Father and Christ, you're all one. It is what Jesus prayed in John 17. I'm not going to go there, but when you get the chance, read John chapter 17, the whole chapter. And it talks about how, how we are now one with the Father and one with him, one with one another. So the glory has come upon all of us when we come into Christ Jesus. That's some good stuff right there. Now watch this. In verse 18, it says, For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. Now, it says, For the anxious longing of creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. So even nature itself is waiting for us to act like who we are, to be who we are. Don't you know that nature was waiting for Christ to come? Couldn't wait for Christ to come. Now that Christ has come, he's died on the cross. He's ascended into heaven, sitting on the right hand of, fa right hand of the Father. Now creation is waiting for us to manifest the Son through the glory that has been poured and released in us, that it will come forth from us, and that even this earth can see the miracles of Christ as if he's here. And that's why Christ said, and greater work shall you do. Now, let's look at this. And I love this scripture right here. I love this verse. It's in, it's in Ephesians chapter 2. And it says, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So now when I accepted Christ, the moment I accepted Christ, the moment you accepted Christ, you were immediately seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, which places everything under your feet. Why would that place everything under your feet? Because now you have the authority of Christ. That's why he says, all authority has been given unto me, 
Go ye therefore and make disciples of all men. What is he saying? Remember I just said, you are a joint heir with Christ Jesus. Jesus just now have all authority. And now he's sharing that authority with us. He's sharing that glory with us. And now he's saying, use that authority, use that power to go and make disciples. Now that he's saying that, now that that is his command, now you and I, we have an obligation to learn how to release what's been put on the inside of us. So it's not a matter of getting it. It's a matter of learning how to release it. Okay, now watch this. John chapter 14, verse 12, it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, and I was talking about this, He who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these will he do. Wait a minute. He's saying that you and I are supposed to do greater works, greater works, greater miracles. That's why it's not a stretch for us to believe that when Jesus told them to feed him, he was asking them to do the miracle. Are you following what I'm saying right now? Now, watch this. It says, whatever you ask in my name, that will I do so that the father may be glorified in the son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. But it's according to faith. So how do we take that level, that, that faith to another level where when we ask for God, we're really expecting it to manifest? We do that through fasting and praying. Fasting and praying, I believe, I deeply believe this, fasting and praying does not bring more power. Fasting and praying allows us to release more power. In other words, we begin to get revelation and understanding of that which is in us, and God begins to speak to us and teach us through, through, through fasting, through praying, through praying, through fasting, he begins to teach us how to release what's in us. And then we begin to see great, ma greater manifestations through our fasting and praying. But it's not that God said, because you're fasting and praying, I'm releasing more power. He's saying that because you're fasting and praying, you're killing the flesh, that which was in the way, you're now killing it so that that which was hindering the glory from coming forth, you're killing it. Now I can show you how to release what's in you. Does this make sense? All right. So, he says this, he says, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. I begin to get more confidence that he does it through my fellowship with him, through my relationship with him. Do you understand? All right, let's look at this in Matthew and I'm almost done. I hope you're getting something out of this. Matthew 14 and 15. I know I'm reading a lot of scriptures. I always do. I want you to understand that this is not me saying this but this is the word of God saying this. So Matthew 14 and 15, it says, when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this place is desolate. Remember we was talking about this? This is, this is where I'm about to show you how God wanted them to do the miracle. So he says, this, they said, this place is desolate and the hour is already late. So send the crowd away that they may go into the village and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said to them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, we have here only five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Ordering the people to sit down on the grass, he took the five loaves and the two fish and he looked up towards heaven. He blessed the food and he broke the loaves and he gave them to the disciples and the, the disciples gave them to the crowd. And they all ate and were satisfied. They picked up what was left over the broken pieces, 12 full baskets, there were about 5,000 men who ate besides the women and the children. Now, let me ask you this question. How many disciples were there? The answer, obviously, 12. How many baskets did they have? The answer, obviously, 12. So they had 12 baskets when they began to pass out the food. Now watch this. Before I go, before I hit this, I want you to get this point right here. This is very crucial. Jesus, he blessed it and he broke it. My question to you is this, do you know how to bless food? The answer is yes. Do you know how to break food? The answer is yes. So since you know how to bless food and you know how to break food, the only thing that needs to be added to this scenario, this, this scenario or this story for you to do it is the faith to believe that it's going to multiply. That's all that's needed because you know how to bless food, you know how to break it. But now that's not the real good part. I'm about to tell you the real good part. Remember I was saying there were 12 disciples 
and there were also 12 baskets. So when Jesus broke the fish and he broke the bread, he put it into the 12 baskets. And then the disciples began to walk and they began to pass out the fish and the bread. The fish and the bread didn't multiply until the disciples were passing it out. Mm. It didn't multiply until the disciples was putting the fish in the children's hands, in the men's hands. It didn't multiply until they were taking the bread and putting it in the women's hands. So the miracle was happening through the disciples. And Jesus still, when he put that demand on them, he still had his demand fulfilled because the food multiplied as the disciples were passed. Jesus didn't pass it out. The disciples passed it out. So yes, Jesus was a serious part of the miracle, but so were the disciples. But isn't that how all miracles work? Is that Jesus is always a part of the miracles that operate through us, but we also play a part. In fact, the Bible says, and as they went, they did miracles and the Lord worked with them. The Bible says the Lord worked with them. Our problem is we don't hardly ever give God an opportunity to work with us. So what do we have to do? We have to begin to work with God so that he can do the miracles that he's commanding us or demanding us to do. This is good right here. We have to understand that God wants to use us. Why? Because we are in the end times. This is perilous times. This is the difficult times. And God needs us to let our light shine before men so that they will see our works and glorify him. That's what time and that's what season we're in right now. So now we have an obligation. We have an obligation to learn how to walk in the spirit, to be the sons of God that God is calling us to be because light is needed in this world and it begins to manifest through the miracles, through the signs, through the wonders. Yes, through the love, through the grace that we carry, through the fruits of the spirit, through all of those things, we manifest the son. But my point is, is that we have to have faith to, manis to manifest what God wants us to manifest. Even nature itself, as I've read earlier, is waiting for us to step forward and to be who God is calling us to be. Here's the problem. I'm trying to end, but here's the problem. The problem is, and the Bible says this, it says that we need to be doers of the word and not just hearers of the word. For when you are a doer of the word, it means that you look into the word of God and you do it. But when you're just a hearer of the word of God, it means that you're reading the word of God but after you read it, you forget what manner of man or woman that you are. You walk away and you don't do what you just read or you don't be. Here's a better word. You don't be what you just read. Now, why do I say be what you just read? Because the Bible describes itself as a mirror in this particular text. In this text, it says in James, it says when you look at the word, you're looking in a mirror. When you look in a mirror, you see what you are. I'm seeing what I am. If you have the spirit of Christ dwelling in you, then you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. As the Bible says, if the spirit of Christ is in you, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. But when many times when we read the word, we're identifying with the flesh and we think that this is impossible. But not if you identify with who God has made you to be. You are a new creature in Christ Jesus now. And the world needs you to be who God has made you to be. And that is the bottom line. So you have to come out of this place of, I'm a sinner, I'm saved by grace. You're no longer a sinner, you're a saint now. You were a sinner, but now God has saved you. He has delivered you. That's the meaning of salvation. It means deliverance and it means to be saved. You've been saved from your flesh. You've been saved from your old position of a sinner. And if you haven't, then I've already told you how to be saved. And don't worry, I'm going to pray with you and we're going to make sure that you're sealed for the time of when Christ comes. If you want to pray and you want to believe God for that. But those of you, I'm talking to believers now, 
Those of you that have accepted Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God has come on the inside of you. And now it's up to you to release what God has placed on the inside of you. There's a great demand. And that is the great demand. That's what God is calling us to walk in. So we have to fulfill the great demand. So where does it start? How do I begin this, 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 this course? Or how do I get on this path? You begin to pray and ask God to show you what he's done on the inside of you. Ask him to give you the confidence that you need to trust in him, to have the faith. And you'll start walking in miracles, signs, and wonders because this is the time and this is the season for this. I know it's Mother's Day, but isn't Mother's Day one of the greatest uh, one of the greatest gifts you can give to your mother is salvation and walking out what God has for you to do? It is. So in saying that, let's begin to be what God has called us to be. Let's do what God has called us to do. Let's accomplish. Let's bring this kingdom that God has placed on the inside of us. Remember, Jesus taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what we need to walk out. That's what we need to carry out. And I'm going to pray with you right now. I'm going to pray for three different people. I'm going to pray for those that need to walk out what God has placed on them. You already said, you know, this is speaking, this is speaking directly to you. You know what God is calling you to do. So I want to pray for you. I also want to pray for those that has kind of that have kind of slipped away. You've kind of slipped away. You haven't been following Christ full strength. The Bible says, anyone that wishes to come after me, this is Jesus talking, anyone that wishes to come after me must deny himself, take up the cross and follow him. You haven't been a follower like you should be. You haven't denied yourself. You've allowed many times your flesh to tell you what to do. And so I'm going to pray for you as well. And then the last group of people I'm going to pay, pray for are those that have not accepted Jesus Christ. God loves you. He cares for you. And you need to come to Christ. You need to give your life to Jesus. This is, these are the last days. And whatever joy, whatever good time you think you may be having right now is going to come to an end. And you and I, we all, we're going to have to stand before God and give an account for what he has called us to do. So let's bow our heads. And, find, let's, and, and I just want all of us, just repeat after me. And then I'm pray for those that need salvation. And then I'm going to pray for the call. So, Father, I just want you to repeat after me. Say, Father, I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. I confess with my mouth that you are the Lord Jesus Christ and that you died for my sin. And by your blood, I am cleansed. I ask you to cleanse me from all of my sin. For I am a sinner. But, Father, through the blood of Jesus Christ, I'm asking you now to make me a saint. I'm asking you to make me a son. You said that if I would confess my sin, that you would forgive me from all unrighteousness. I pray now, and I'm asking you to forgive me in the name of Jesus. Amen. You prayed that prayer. You meant it from your heart. You are now saved. Let me pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for that one that have just given their life to Christ. I pray, Lord, that you would touch them, that you would minister to them, I pray, Lord, that you would bring them into a body of believers, a good church, Lord, that they can grow and learn and understand what you have just done on the inside of them. Father, lead them to a place. And Lord, if they need to be baptized, they haven't been baptized. They just gave their life to Christ. They need to be baptized. Lord, I pray, Lord, that they will be baptized. And Lord, that you would baptize them also in the power of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, that you would set them on fire for you, God. I pray now in the name of Jesus, touch them, do a new thing in their heart right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now I want to pray for those that you know you've been slacking and you need to <laughs> really commit your life to Christ for real this time. I want you to bow your head. I'm going to pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for everyone, Lord. They know, Father, that they need to place a strong commitment uh, of their life. They need to give their life to you. Father, then many times they've been playing and haven't been serious about this. But Lord, this is a time and this is a season. This is a season where they need to be serious about you. Lord, I pray, Lord, that they will give, recommit their life to you in a new way, in a brand new way. Father, recommit their life. And Lord, that they would join themselves to a body of believers that will help them grow 
and to release the power of God that's on the inside of them. Lord, I pray and I cover them. My Father, I rebuke the demonic forces and attacks that have come against them. Ha, huh. Father, I pray, Lord, for those that have been trouble, been having trouble sleeping and resting. Father, I rebuke depression and oppression. I command it to go now in the name of Jesus. Off of everyone that's listening right now, I command depression and oppression to go now. I speak and I use the authority of Christ as a royal king and a priesthood. I command it to go. I command it to loose off of you now in the name of of Jesus. Father, I speak to pains. I speak to back pains. I speak, Lord, to hip pains. I command them to go. I command them to be released now. Father, I speak to headaches and I command them to go now by the power that's in the blood of Jesus Christ. Headaches go now. Headaches go now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I break the power of it right now in the name of Jesus. Father, I speak to all aches and pains with the, throughout the body. Now, Father, I call and I speak perfect alignment in the body by the power that's in the blood of Jesus Christ. In the blood of Jesus Christ. Be healed now. Be healed now. I thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit invading their room now, invading that place now. Father, that they will feel your touch and, Lord, that they would know that you've done something supernatural in their life. And, Father, because of this day, they will never be the same. I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. For those of you that experienced the move of God and the touch of God, I just want you to put in the thread, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And I just want you to share your quick testimony with us, what the Lord has done. Just write, and if you've given your life to the Lord, just put in the thread, uh, I've given my life to the Lord. Anytime and every time you do something and God does something, for you and you talk about it, it brings strength to what God has done. The Bible says that we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the words of our testimony or the words that um, by the words of the goodness of giving praise to God for what he's done for us. And he did not love their life unto death, but God has done, but if God has done something for you, and I know he has, I just want you to put it in the thread right there. And I just want you to say, thank you, Lord, for whatever God has done. And trust me, when you give thanks for that, it's recorded in heaven and God remembers it. So I just thank you for it. Well, we've had a great Mother's Day. We are so excited that you was with us and that God will continue to bless you throughout this day. We love you here at Embassy Christian Center. If you want to get in touch with us or contact us, you can do so very easily. You can contact us with that number, 210-880-9841. You can also text to that number if you want to text something personal to that number. Uh, we will receive it. I will receive it. And I will respond back to you. So feel free to respond to that text number. We love you. We care for you. And we just wish you a happy Mother's Day. We love you. Every mother that's out there, we love you. We care for you. And we want you to be blessed in this day. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. As we come before the Lord with our tithes and offerings this morning, we are mindful that these are indeed perilous times. But we can take comfort from Scripture, knowing that in good times and in bad times, when we know what's going on and when we don't know what's going on, that God is in control and has everything in His hands. As Ecclesiastes 11.5 states, As you do not know what is the way of the wind, or how the bones grow in the womb of her who is with child, so you do not know the works of God who makes everything. We can be greatly encouraged that although we may have some apprehension about what's taking place at this time, that God has it completely under control. And knowing that God has everything under control, let us be encouraged to continue to do those things that God has called us to do. As verse six states, in the morning sow your seed, and in the evening do not withhold your hand, for you do not know which will prosper, either the morning sowing or the evening sowing, or whether both alike will be good. So let us be encouraged to continue to do those things that God has called us to do, to be faithful in our tithes and offerings, giving to the work of the church so that the kingdom of heaven can be manifested here on earth as it is in heaven. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you 
that you are our provider at all times, Lord, in good times and in bad, Lord. And we know that whatever goes on outside of us, Lord, in our hearts and souls, we know that you have it under control and that you have everything that we need and provide all that we need. So we come before you with these tithes and offerings today, Lord, to give glory and honor to your name. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Amen. 